Hi, my name is Lucas Hall and welcome to this webinar. Uh, we're, <laughs> this webinar is entitled Essential Tips for Being a Successful Landlord and I'm just, I'm giddy. I'm so excited to be teaching this today. This is such a great presentation and it was originally given in Portland, Oregon in front of a live audience and it was designed to be uh, a workshop uh, where it was actually, it actually turned out to be quite an intimate experience of, of being able to talk about real issues and trying to solve real problems together. And it was so successful that we decided to turn this into a, uh, a more generic kind of nationwide presentation. So we've removed anything that's specific to Oregon and kind of made it more of a, a generalized uh, uh, presentation for the United States and uh, tried to add some more additional information, to just really make it value packed. So with that said, let's get started. Number one uh, in the agenda is I'm going to go through these tips that I'm talking about and, and um, the tips on being a successful landlord. And uh, these are all tips that I've actually learned through blood, sweat and tears and trying to figure it out myself in the beginning. And uh, the mentors that I've had over the over the years who have taught me uh, tricks <laughs> in uh, trying to be a very profitable landlord, but while still having very happy tenants. So. These are the best of the best tips that I have, and I'm excited to share them. Number two, we're going to go through important rental laws that I think every landlord should know. Most landlords really have no clue what their state statutes are. And so though we're not going to get into specific states because there's 50 of them, uh, what we are going to do is talk about which laws you need to look up. So if you only knew 10 laws in your state, you would um, you'd be pretty set. So. I'll show you which ones to go look up. And then number three, we're going to talk about useful guides and resources that every landlord should uh, pay attention to. And some of these I've put together and built and other ones are resources that I've found along the way. And, and I just really want to collect them and share them with you. So who am I and why am I qualified or why should you listen to me? Again, my name is Lucas Hall. I've been a landlord for about 10 years and I am the founder of landlordology.com. Uh, I built Landlordology really out of a, out of necessity, uh, starting out as a, a landlord who had no idea what he was doing. And I, I really was frustrated with the quality of landlord sites out there. And I just thought, you know, there's nothing that I felt was at a high standard that could, that could meet the needs of a small independent landlord like myself. And so I thought I could just build it. I, I'm learning a lot. I could just write about all this stuff. And so after about, you know, seven years, I had the idea. And then about eight years into being a landlord, I, um, I really started to try to craft this website. And then about a year ago, I met the CEO of Cozy. Uh, his name is Gino and he's, he's fantastic. But he and I started talking and just getting to know each other. And, and we realized that we were really trying to accomplish the same thing. Cozy builds software for landlords. And uh, that software is designed to make a landlord's life and a tenant's life much easier and just improve the quality of that relationship. And that's all I was trying to do through Landlordology anyway. Uh, I just was using articles and they're using software. So it was a nice fit and I ended up joining the Cozy team uh, in January of 2014. And it's been great. So I'm the chief landlordologist and community manager over there. And my job is to just help landlords across the country. I also currently have about four properties and 17 tenants. Th those numbers fluctuate from time to time as I buy and sell properties and switch over tenants. So sometimes that'll fluctuate as high as 26 or even 30 tenants and, uh, you know, four or six properties. And so uh, I'm always looking for another buy and, and uh, looking for ways to improve revenue. Last but not least, uh, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> this, is, this should not be legal advice. And uh, you should definitely seek the advice of a licensed local attorney because there are so many local laws that that apply to landlord and uh, landlords and tenants. And uh, if you don't know them or don't know to look for them, it could get you in a lot of trouble. So I uh, I never will be a lawyer, I don't think, and I will never be able to truly give legal advice. It's just that I'm an, uh, a, an experienced landlord and I try to give just quality, ethical landlord advice. So before you act on anything that you learn from me, please do talk to a, an attorney if it's to see if it's a good decision for you. So 
with that said, I also want to tell you a quick story. I bought my first rental property uh, when I was younger, and and actually, it, it's I met this girl that I really liked, and I bought my first rental property to impress her. <laughs> I uh, I was talking to her. I really enjoyed hanging out with her, and I said, "Hey, what'd you do last week?" And she goes, "Well, I bought a house," and I just was speechless. I didn't know what to say, and so after my jaw you know, came up off the floor. I said, well, what do you mean you bought a house? You, you know, you're not married. You're not, you know, you're a young, single, beautiful woman. And she goes, well, I'm, I'm, I bought a house and I put um, some tenants and I found some tenants and I'm living there and they're basically paying my mortgage. And I thought, wow, she's smart and pretty. So I did the next logical thing. And I actually hired her sister who is a real estate agent. And I told her, Find me a house in her neighborhood that's bigger. <laughs> Gosh, I was ballsy. So then I I found a six bedroom house because she had a five bedroom and I bought it and it was, you know, less than a half a mile away from her house. <laughs> I went and I found five of my closest, dearest friends who I didn't know on Craigslist, and I just said, Hey, will you move in with me? Here's, you know, the rent's like four hundred bucks or something per room and and I ended up comping my entire mortgage through them, which was awesome. And I lived there for a number of years, you know, with no rent payment, no mortgage payment, nothing. It was awesome. Uh, well, other than that house, uh, this story does have a happy ending. So that that girl, I guess, must have been oppressed or, or just thought it was cute or something. Or maybe she just had sympathy on me. <laughs> but uh, we ended up getting married three years later. And uh, we've been married for a number of years now. And, and uh, we actually just adopted a little girl from Ethiopia. Uh, her name is Ashton. And, and we're so excited to have her part of our life. So best decision if anybody out there is considering adoption. It's just so wonderful. So back to real life. <laughs> I'm going to walk you through the steps of being a landlord and the things that a landlord commonly has to deal with. And then sometimes my top three or four tips in each of those sections. So the first section is if you have a property, you need to find tenants, right? And the best way to do that is to have listings and showings of the property. So whenever I have a vacant property or a, a property that's coming up for renewal, I always post on Craigslist and I use a site called Postlets. I think they're still number one, at least in my areas. Uh, they work better than all the other sites. And the beauty of this is that that Craigslist just has the massive numbers, but also Postlets is actually owned by Zillow. And what they do is they let you create a little listing. And once it's complete, it syndicates that listing to Zillow and Trulia and Hotpads and, you know, about a dozen other uh, reputable sites and post it there as if you went to each one of those sites and posted it yourself. The beauty of that is that you can now hit the gambit of all of these big time listing sites with one centralized listing. So then you can log into postlets and make edits to that listing and you can change the price or the dates of the open house or whatever you want. And it will then syndicate those edits back to all the other sites. It's really fantastic. And it even has an export feature. So you can take a snippet of code and paste that into Craigslist and then make a very pretty looking Craigslist ad too. So check both of those out. Definitely use Craigslist, but Postlets is awesome too. Um, those are really the only two that I, I ever use. With that said, even though Postlets is awesome, uh, I still get 90% of my tenants from Craigslist. It's just a Goliath. It just has, it just has the numbers, um, but that doesn't mean I don't stop using Postlets. So I, I definitely have found some tenants through Trulia or Zillow through Postlets. Uh, number two Everyone says location, location, location is the most important thing in real estate, and that is true. But I would argue that the second most important thing are your pictures. And so I have a, a thing that I kind of gauge my pictures by is when I look at it, does it have the oh pretty factor? <laughs> Sometimes I call it the oh shiny factor. And it's just, you know, if someone looks at this, would they say, ooh, pretty? <laughs> and that's what I want for every single one of my pictures. Pictures sell a property or they, they rent a property. And if you have horrible pictures up, you're not going to get any inquiries. They're just not going to go. 
Um, there are plenty of other houses on the block that uh, are in, in the location and neighborhood that tenants are looking for that have better pictures. So make sure that you beat out all of your competition with quality pictures. If you don't have a professional style camera, you can hire, um, you know, dozens of professional photographers found on Craigslist and they'll come out for 50 or maybe a hundred bucks. They'll shoot your whole property and, and uh, give you the, the digital copies that you can do whatever you want with. Uh, I also like to use a little company called Circle Pix. It's circlepix.com. And they're a national company that will send out a photographer who is qualified. And they'll even take those 360 degree photos for you, which are really neat. And then they'll host those photos for you too in some pretty looking website with some music. And um, it's it's served me pretty well for you know $100 to $150. Mm-hmm. The last thing I like to do is something called a landlord's open house. And I, I've never, I may have coined that term. I'm not sure. I've never heard that term anywhere else, but that's what I call it. And what that means is uh, you have an open house style showing, but it's by appointment only. So I don't want people just walking through my house. It's disrespectful to my other tenants. And I kind of want to control things a little bit more, perhaps. And maybe that's just my fault. But um, what I do is on maybe Monday of that week, I'll post a couple ads and I'll start getting inquiries back that day and into the next couple days. And as I get these inquiries, I'll say, hey, it sounds great. Let me set up a time to schedule it with you uh, to, to schedule a showing. And, and what I'll do is I'll pick a day on the weekend, maybe a Saturday or a Sunday, and I'll just pick a block of time, maybe one o'clock to four o'clock. And I'll tell my current tenants that, hey, I want to show the house to people between one and four. Can you just please vacate, like go out to eat, go go to a music park or something. Just, you know, you guys are great, but get out of here. And if I ask nicely, they'll usually, you know, accommodate me because quite frankly, they don't want to be around when I bring in, you know, 20 people. They just kind of want to get out of here. So the idea is that you, you schedule these uh, showings back to back every single, every 30 minutes during that block of time. And uh, hopefully you're posting quality ads that are getting responses. And if you're not, then maybe it's not priced correctly or maybe you're not, your pictures aren't good enough or whatever. But the idea is to get as many people get set up for that block of time as possible. What this accomplishes is that you'll have anywhere from, you know, if you have a lot, you'll have anywhere from maybe you know, four to eight showings all set up within a few hours. And it won't waste your time, it won't waste your tenant's time, and it won't waste the applicant's time or the, or the potential tenant's. And they will inevitably kind of pass each other during these showings. So people will be coming as people are going, and it will create this sense of competition, and it will create this sense of, ooh, this house is kind of hot. And that's what I want. So I, I'm just kind of playing them against each other. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'm not demanding they give me deposits or anything, but... Uh, I'll tell you what has happened for me multiple times. Uh, I have this one house that's in a great area and uh, I usually get a lot of inquiries, but, but uh, that particular landlord's open house that I had on Saturday, I basically started advertising on Monday and by Saturday I had, um, I think it was almost 35 people came through uh, all in, they were all groups of people uh, looking for this as a group house and I had three of those groups wanting to give me deposits right then and there so they could, you know, put their stamp on this house and, and have me take it off the market for them. So it works really well. And, and I only would waste, you know, a week to try to market that. Um, it also works fairly well for properties that aren't in great locations, but you just might have to market your ad a little bit better. So next is applications. Once you find that that group of tenants or tenants that want to rent it, you first have to go through the application process and and make sure that they're qualified. I only use online applications. I don't even bother with paper applications anymore. I used to, but it is just a pain. Online applications are the way to go because um, their sensitive, personally identifiable information is is on there and you have to secure that uh, oftentimes by law. And what that means is um, particularly if you're requesting a social security number, you have to put it in a, um, a locked file cabinet behind some sort of door with a deadbolt uh, in, in many states. 
And if, you know, you're ever robbed, you have a, you have to report it and it's just a hassle. So using online applications, all of that information gets stored securely somewhere. And uh, you have to be careful about which company you use for online applications. You definitely got to find somebody that, or some company that has bank level security and really treats it with the sensitivity that it, that it needs. So uh, Cozy, and that's one of the great things that they do is they, they uh, not only pull in those tenants in the application process, but then they store them uh, in very secure servers and, and they don't, um, you know, they don't uh, leave it open for anybody to hack into or, or uh, make it easy for anybody other than you to access those. So that actually leads me to my next point. Number two, I might be the only landlord who is preaching this because it's definitely going against the, the grain, but I do not believe that a social security number is required uh, for a landlord to make a screening decision. And uh, again, <laughs> every time I say this, there's inevitably a few people thinking, well, I, I need one for a credit report or a background check. How can I do it without it? Or, or I need a social security number if I want to ruin their credit, if they you know, leave and um, yeah, have a bunch of unpaid rent. I need that. I need that. And um, in actuality, you don't. So you can do all of that without a social security number. And in fact, uh, times are changing. So identity theft is the number one crime in America, and it uh, continues to grow. Uh, it, it outnumbers almost all, all of the other crimes put together. Um, it is just so easy for people to steal identities and steal social security numbers. And and uh, last time I heard, according to the FTC, one in every 20 Americans will have their identity stolen this year. And so I have almost 20 tenants right now. And if a tenant has their identity stolen this year, which statistically they will, uh, the police are going to come to them and they're writing up the report and they're going to say, um, ma'am, who has access to your social security number? Who, you know, who could have done this? And the first thing they're going to say is, well, my landlord does, you know, he's a good guy, but you know, he's got all that information. And so I'm instantly a suspect and that's just drama. I don't need. So to answer the questions that you're all thinking, credit reports, uh, you don't need a social security number unless you're using a third party, uh, screening company. Uh, all of the big credit bureau agencies, have developed systems where you as a landlord can request a credit report from a tenant without ever collecting that social security number. And in fact, all you really need is an email address. And they've done this because identity theft is such a huge ordeal. So Cozy, again, also does this. They they were actually the forerunner um, and worked with Experian to uh, develop this, this product. So Cozy is the flagship uh, was really first to market with this and then to bring experience capability out for landlords to use. And what it does is inside the cozy dashboard, you know, which is your landlord account. When you finally find an applicant that you like, you can just click a button and what it does is it sends an email to the tenant and the tenant then works directly with Experian um, through cozy and pulls that credit report and they pay Experian and you get a copy of it. Um, it's really quite genius and it's just so hands off. <laughs> I used to fax in my my printed paper handwritten application to third party screening companies. And then oftentimes they'd kick it back because I couldn't read the fax or I didn't have all the information they needed or I forgot to sign the, the disclosure or, or whatever it was. And this just gets rid of all that. You don't need a social security number for background checks. In fact, um, Almost all criminal records now do not have them on there. It's not something you can even search for because the criminals were having their identity stolen because the criminal records are actually public records. And then people were going in there and taking social security numbers and then using it to buy cars and mortgages and all that. So they've all been removed. A social security number is useless when you're looking at criminal background checks. Um, and then lastly, the only time you really need it is if you do win a judgment against a tenant and uh, you want to take it to collections. In that case, you can just simply ask the judge, hey, listen, I don't have a social security number. Can you force him to give it to me? So then I can collect on this debt. And he will say, absolutely. And it will be a court order and you'll get your, your social security number. Problem solved. The last part is collecting applications from all adult applicants. Um, applicants and occupants are the same thing in this case. 
but uh, don't don't let a situation happen where you have one person who might be a, a single breadwinner, single income family, but uh, he has two other adults living with him, maybe a spouse and an adult child. And uh, don't let him just give you him or her give you just one application. You really need to know the names and information of all of the applicants who are adults in your property. Um, they're all jointly and severably held liable for it, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, don't worry about minors. You just need to know about adults. Screening tenants. So now that you have applications, what are you going to do with them? And really, there's about a dozen items that I kind of, you know, bullet points that I go through when I'm considering a tenant. But the most important, and I'll say this again, the most important aspect of screening a tenant is are they able and willing to pay rent? You know, one, do they have the money? And two, have they shown a history of where they actually pay rent uh, versus withhold it for whatever reason? You know, I, on Landlordology, I hear in the comments all the time where people are like, hey, I didn't pay rent because the washing machine was broken. And, you know, that gets into repair and re deduct remedies and, and other state statutes that may or may not allow that. Uh, but, you know, at the, bo uh, the bottom line of that is the tenant was using rent as leverage and then trying to manipulate the situation, uh, whether they were right or wrong to do so, they chose not to pay rent. And so I'm looking for tenants who under all circumstance will pay rent. Um, and if there's issues to re re with repair of the property, um, you know, that they work that out in another way and got it fixed or, or, you know, reimbursed them or whatever. Uh, also, they don't necessarily have to have an income. So <laughs> I had an applicant who uh, on his application said he had a, he made zero dollars. And I thought, I, you know, I actually called him up. I said, what are you doing? You know, the, the apartment's 1400 bucks. How can you, how can you afford it? You don't have an income. And he goes, oh, I've got $2 million in the bank. And sure enough, he had a trust fund, you know, he was 22 and had $2 million in the bank. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, you can show me a bank statement. That's great. Uh, but I still need to know that you're willing to pay rent. And uh, I just said, if you, you know, it was only a four month lease. I said, if you're willing to write a check for four months worth of rent, then this is not an issue. And, and sure enough, I got a check in the mail. So uh, my state did not have a, a limit on the amount of prepaid rent I could have. So that wasn't an issue either. But anyway, uh, the next big thing that I do is that I, I call two of the last landlords, the former landlords, and I always call two of them, if not three of them. The most current landlord won't really know how to answer all the questions simply because the tenant is probably still living there. So they haven't settled the deposit. They haven't formally moved out yet, and they don't really know what the condition is going to be like when they move out. But the landlord before that will know all those. So I really like to talk to the landlord from two, two sessions ago and, and ask um, a bunch of questions. But most importantly, would you rent to them again? It is the question that sums up everything. They may say, oh, they were kind of pushy and blah, blah, blah. But, but at the end of the day, if they would rent to them again, then that's okay. You know, as long as they paid their rent on time and they, they, weren't, um, they didn't destroy the property, I, I could care less. But if the guy says, no, I would never rent to them again. They were horrible. Then, you know, that's worth mentioning. Number three, when screening a tenant, you have to be considerate of, uh, to, you know, considerate of discrimination and, and you can't discriminate. Uh, I like to call these the federal seven. And these are the, the federally mandated classes that you cannot discriminate against. And that's race, color, religion, sex, uh, national origin. Uh, family status and disability. And so that includes the number of children or number of people in the family or mental, even mental disabilities, which unfortunately uh, hoarding is considered a, a mental disability if it's severe enough. So that's a presentation in its own. So we won't get into that too much. Uh, but I do want to mention that number four, a sex offender is not a protected class. I don't care who you are. If you're a registered sex offender, uh, it doesn't matter when it was, you will never, ever, 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 ever rent from me. So get over it. It's just not even 
an option. And there's a fantastic website. Uh, it's a government website listed there on the presentation. And you can go there and you can type in anybody's name and even the county or city where they're at. And you can look and f see if they're on their a sex offender registry. And uh, it's all public information. It, even a step further, you can, uh, if you don't know the name of somebody, you can just Google or not Google. You can use this database to search for a zip code or an address. And you can actually see where the sex offenders are in your neighborhood uh, and where they're living, which is a little scary, but, but again, I'm glad it's there. So I always check that website because I just, I don't know, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if, if something happened to somebody because of, you know, I let a sex offender into my property. Um, granted, there are, there are worse cases than others, but, but it's just not worth the risk. Next, once you actually have a, a tenant that has passed all of your screening requirements, you need to collect a deposit from them. And so I know a lot of property managers and landlords don't actually collect that deposit until move-in day. I think that's a big mistake because the, the tenant doesn't have any skin in the game until that point. You know, if until the point they give over some cash, they're really not invested in it. So if you're taking your place off the market, you need to be compensated for that. And what I do is I say, hey, listen, if you really want the place, um, you know, it's going to take us maybe another week or two to sign a lease and you may not be moving in for another you know, month or two. So give me your deposit now. I'll hold it. And that will be your earnest money deposit, which will allow me to take the property off the market. And when you actually move in, we'll just convert that money to a security deposit and we'll hold it until the end of the lease. That way, once they do that, I've actually never had anybody back out once they do that. But if I don't take that deposit early on, then they they feel like they can leave if they find something better because, heck, they can. There's nothing stopping them. They don't get penalized. You really can't take them to court if they haven't signed a lease yet. Um, and you're just, you know, up a river without a paddle. <laughs> uh, number two, useful. Um, the deposit is useful as compensation for damages material or financial. And this is so important. Some people think that you can just withhold an entire deposit because they might, you know, break the rules or they damage one, one room of carpet. Uh, and you can just hold the whole thing. Uh, it's not true. You really have to compensate, use it as compensation for damages. And so if the carpet only costs six hundred dollars to replace, but the deposit was a thousand dollars, then you have to give back four hundred dollars back to the tenant. That's their money. It doesn't belong to the landlord at all. Um, it's just used in case of issues. You cannot withhold the deposit for normal wear and tear. It has to be damages of beyond normal wear and tear. It can be uh, also things like unpaid rent or unpaid utilities or even late fees that they never paid uh, but but are legitimate. So uh, you can't withhold a deposit for, for emotional stress or, um, or just because they were mean. Um, and I even know some landlords who say, hey, they didn't give me 30 days notice like they were told to in the lease. They only gave me 29, so therefore they lost their entire deposit. Gosh, if, if you're doing that, you're going to get sued so bad because you really had, you might have had one day of, damage on that because they they missed it so be careful um and don't commingle funds this is so important too this is deposits are one of the biggest areas of, of lawsuits so uh, pay attention don't commingle funds don't mix personal funds with security deposits keep them separate and in fact i recommend opening up some sort of money market account that bears interest uh, and you have check writing capabilities for it uh, I use Ally Bank. Uh, they're a great company, um, and a national company. I think they used to be GMAC Bank, but they have some really great interest rate check bearing um, or check writing money market accounts. So, open up an account for each one of your properties and just you know put the deposit in there and leave it there. Don't touch it. Just let it collect interest, and at the end of the lease, go get it. That's the only thing that account is used for. Next, leases. So it's finally time to sign a lease with somebody. They've given you a deposit. 
and you're trying to put it together. If you pull anything from this presentation, it's it's the first thing on this lease page. Use a rock solid lease and stick to it. I'll say it again. Use a rock solid lease and stick to it. Go get yourself a state specific lease with the clauses that you need and are required by law of your state and modify it and add, add any provisions that you might want to add in there. You know, just because some lawyer wrote it up doesn't mean it's a perfect fit for you. You're allowed to modify it or get the lawyer to do so. Uh, there's even a bunch of really great, uh, great um, legal forms websites, but make sure they're reputable and, uh, and then check your state statutes to make sure it follows your state laws. Uh, with that said, you know, you, you really want to make sure that you follow it. So if there's a, a late fee that is implemented on the fifth of the month and they don't pay rent by the fifth of the month, just assign the late fee. It, you know, it, you have to stick the lease if you expect them to stick to the lease. If you start deviating from that, they're going to think, and eh, this landlord's not very serious. And if they deviated once, then they can deviate later. And, and then, you know, they have a right to be mad when you actually do try to enforce something in the lease because you didn't do it earlier. So uh, just stick to it and the lease becomes the bad guy and not you. You know, you can just say, oh, the lease says to do this. And uh, and it, it puts the onus on the tenant to make sure that they know what's in the lease. Anyway, uh, I'll get off my soapbox there. Uh, number two, every adult applicant, I'm sorry, every adult occupant uh, signs a lease with joint and several liability. And I briefly mentioned this earlier, but joint and several liability is like the three musketeers, all for one and one for all. All of the tenants are equally responsible for the entire rent amount. So if you have a group house and there's six people there and five of them decide to get up and just leave or join the Peace Corps and they're out of the country, that one tenant or any of the tenants that you can get a hold of is still liable for the whole rent amount. And this is a common issue with uh, group houses because inside group houses, they think, oh, I, I just pay my portion of the rent and then everything's good, right? And they don't realize that, no, you, every, the whole rent is still due no matter what. And so you want to make sure that in your lease, you mention that all of the applicants have joint and several liability. So make sure that all the people sign that lease too. Cozy does a great job with uh, making sure that they enforce joint and several liability with payments. And it and I can get to that a little bit later, but basically it says that uh, when a tenant, uh, when five tenants or six tenants all use Cozy with their landlord, they make uh, separate payments, but then Cozy consolidates those payments. And when the rent payment has equaled what is, what is owed, then the landlord gets his money. So the landlord actually just doesn't get the money until it's all paid, which is the way it should be anyway. And that will actually go to support joint and several liability if you ever had to go to court. Number three, review the entire lease with applicants and use e-signature tools. This is fantastic, uh, a fantastic way to really set a solid, stern relationship with your tenants in the beginning. So you can still be friendly, but when it comes to a lease contract, you need to make sure that they understand you mean business. You're not going to deviate from it, and they need to know that those clauses are in there for a reason, and those fines are in there for a reason, and they need to follow it. So what I like to do is I, I call them up. I say, hey, congratulations on the place. I'd like to take you to coffee, and I just want to review the lease with you and make sure that uh, we're all on the same page. And they're usually really excited to do that. It's a great way to start out the relationship and, and be friendly, but firm. If they are not uh, local, or I don't have time to do it in person. I'll just do it over the phone and kind of walk through the lease with them and then use e-signature tools to get them to sign it. And so digital signatures are legally binding. Uh, there is a federal law that, that says that they are, so don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Uh, there's a couple of really great ones that I like to use. One is called HelloSign, uh, hellosign.com. Another one is signnow.com. And then the, the big one is DocuSign.com. DocuSign is, is, is great, but uh, it also starts to get kind of pricey, um, uh, kind of pricey for an independent landlord. 
But Hello Sign is by far my favorite. They just have a really slick interface and, and it seems really easy to use. Next, once those tenants sign the lease and they're all geared up and ready to move in, uh, here are my tips for move-in day or, or uh, getting that, you know, <laughs> making that a smooth transition because they're nervous and they're looking for you uh, to guide them. One thing that I highly recommend you do is specify move-in and move-out times in the lease. And note that I said times, not days, times. So in my leases, at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of a, an existing lease, it always says that the move out time is 10 o'clock in the morning on the last day of the lease. Well, the move in time also says, you know, the first day of the lease, which is usually the first of a month at, at two o'clock in the afternoon. So if the tenants move out at 10 o'clock on the 30th and the new tenants can't move in until two o'clock on the first, that actually gives me 28 hours between tenants where the place is vacant. And uh, both of those days, the 30th and the first are always paid for in full by those tenants because you pay by the day, not by the hour. And if I plan accordingly, I can do a lot of stuff in 28 hours. I can, I can hire a couple cleaners, you know, two or three times over. I can make repairs to any part of the house that I want. Um, I probably couldn't, well, maybe I could replace a roof <laughs> if the roof is quick in 28 hours. Uh, but there's a lot you can do. And, and it's a great way to make sure that you don't have any vacancies at all. Uh, because you have somebody moving out on the last day and somebody moving on the first day. Uh, but you still are allowed a lot of time in between to do what you need to do to the house to get it ready for the next tenants. I've done this for almost 10 years and it's allowed me to have uh, not even a single day of vacancy among um, all my properties in, in 10 years. I've never had a single day of vacancy and I, I work incredibly hard during that transition period and I look incredibly early for new tenants. Uh, there are oftentimes where I'll be up for 22 hours straight, making sure that that transition, you know, 22 out of the 28 hours, I'm at that house making sure everything goes right. But, um, but you know, then I get to relax for the rest of the year. So anyway, move in, move out times. Number two, keys. I don't give out keys any earlier than day one of the lease. And in fact, if the lease time starts at two o'clock, I don't give out lease or keys until two o'clock. And the reason is, Though a tenant may understand that they can't technically move in until day one of their lease at two o'clock, if they have keys, they will absolutely be tempted and sometimes execute on that temptation. They will go over to the house to show their family, show their, their friends, I look at this great new place I found, you know, I've got a key to it. Or they'll go move in stuff into the basement or into the storage unit. Uh, or they'll say, oh, I just went over to measure the rooms because I didn't know if my couch was going to fit. You know, and if they have a key, they have access. And, and in fact, it's it's a violation for you to give a key out if there's another tenant in there, you know, a current tenant, because that current tenant is paying to have sole access outside of you to that property. And if you give out keys too early to the next tenant, then you could be held liable for any damages that that new tenant might cause to the current tenant's property, uh, not to mention other liabilities. So, um you know, I guess property damage is the least, you know, of your worries. Heaven forbid somebody actually come in and, and get injured or hurt or, or worse. So anyway, uh, hold that, you know, hold that close. Don't give out keys any earlier than day one. Enough with that. <laughs> Number three, I allow a tenant to document the condition and perform the move-in inspection. I don't know how property managers or some property managers uh, refuse to let the tenant do the move-in inspection. I think it's the only way you should do it. How else is the tenant going to have a say in the inspection if you don't let them do the inspection? You know, sure, you can walk around with them and kind of point things out, but they can always just argue that you didn't really give them any say in the matter or you put pressure on them during that time just to sign. So what I do is I always give them the checklist and say, after you move in, you have three days. Just take your time, look around, find every little ding that you want, and then write it down. And what this does is it gives me a great little repair list to do uh, over the next couple of weeks, but then it also gives them a say in it. And so then I take that 
that move-in sheet at the end of the lease and I, I document next to their marks what the condition was when they move out. And obviously I can't charge them for anything that they documented, but, but more often than not, there's other damages. So, you know, I note those in and just say, Hey, listen, you didn't catch this or it wasn't there when you moved in. So now, uh, now you have to pay for it. So I think it's the only true way to do a legitimate move in, move out inspection. Number four, uh, I usually put together a $10 welcome gift, which I give to my tenants on day one. I call these uh, bathroom essential items. I actually wrote a post on Landlordology about it. Uh, <laughs> I think it was called bathroom essentials on move-in day. And uh, what I'll do is I'll put together a roll of paper towels, uh, a roll of toilet paper, a shower liner, and then, um, yeah, I think that's it. And I'll just put that little package, oh, and a bar of soap, like a little hotel bar of soap. And this is no more than $10. And uh, I used to give $60 or $50 Target gift cards or iTunes gift cards or even edible, incredible arrangements. And, you know, I I never actually got a thank you until I gave out toilet paper. (laughs) So as odd as it sounds, it makes perfect sense. Tenants are moving. Everything is in boxes. The majority of them don't realize that a... Shower liner is not included with the property, especially if it's unfurnished. So they're hot and they're sweaty. You know, they have to use the restroom. They need to take a shower because they, they, they've been moving all day and they don't have everything they need. So if you can just give them that, they will be so grateful. And it's a fantastic way to start out a, a caring and nurturing landlord tenant relationship where you're looking out for their best interest. So don't forget the toilet paper. On to the next step, this is the most important, and this is why we're in the business. It's to collect rent. This rent pays our mortgage and pays for part of our retirement, and it's it's fantastic. So this is where you should really focus more than anywhere else. I used to collect rent checks, and I always had problems with it. I mean, I'm sure some of you can relate. I actually uh, switched over a number of years ago to doing online and automatic rent payments, it's the only thing I recommend now because uh, what it does is it forces the tenant to pay online and forces them to set up a recurring deduction from their their checking account, and it just automatically gets transferred to your account. So ever since I started using online and automatic rent payments, I have never had a single uh, late rent check or, or rent payment. I don't collect checks anymore. So. Uh, uh, the only way it could ever be late is if they didn't actually have the money in their account and there was a non-sufficient funds draft. However, if if you're using the right tool, for example, Cozy uh, tries, you know, sets up this online automatic rent payment. If there's non-sufficient funds in the in the tenant's account, uh, very quickly thereafter the landlord has actually sent an email and said, Hey, listen, it didn't go through and it's because there wasn't any money in there. And it gives the landlord the ability to then within a few hours, call up the tenant and say, Hey, listen, if it bounced or failed or whatever, can you just transfer some money into that account and we'll try again. And so as soon as the tenant transfers money, cozy will actually try to take that rent money out again. And oftentimes it can be, it can be fixed within a day or even two. So um, most of the time it's, it's the same day. So there's actually no late fee involved, which makes the tenant happy and the landlord, because then the landlord gets his money on time instead of having to wait seven to 10 days for a rent check to bounce. And then the bank finally mails it back to you. I never quite got that. I don't know why the bank never would just call, but, uh, you know, then they mail it back, uh, with a big fat red stamp on it that says failed. So anyway, I, if you don't if you don't have this set up already, you just try it out. Pick one property and test it on those tenants. Um, try Cozy. It's free for two months. Uh, completely, utterly free. You don't even have to give a credit card for two months. And, um, and you'll be very glad you did. Number two, even though I said I've never, ever since I started doing online and automatic rent payments, I've never had a... Uh, um, a late fee, I still charge hefty late fees if if it happens. It just has never happened. But I always do put in my lease, they have a, a very hefty late fee, sometimes as high as 10% of the rent. Um, 
if they're late. And so uh, what I actually do <laughs> here is I charge a late fee, a one-time late fee, and a daily late fee. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, number three, I, I set up an operating bank account. And this is different from the security deposit account for each property. I only have one operating account no matter how many properties I have. So all of my rent money gets funneled into that one account and then I pay my mortgages and I, I pay contractors out of that one account. That way it keeps all my personal money and my business money separate. Number four, don't collect, don't collect last month's rent up front. I actually don't recommend last month's rent ever. I, I think it's just messy. Uh, there are many state statutes that require you to collect interest on that because it is the tenant's money and you just have to hold it until the lease is over. Uh, too many people, especially if they're not using a separate account, will will keep that money in their personal account and then they'll spend it. And then last month of the lease comes around and, and the landlord is left wondering where did that money go? You know, and, and then they have to come up with a rent payment um, when they weren't expecting to. So uh, if you're worried about not having enough security by not collecting last month's rent, then I would suggest just to collect more deposits. It's the, really the same thing, and it's just so much easier. Most states allow you to collect two or three times the amount of rent in a deposit. Just just do that. Just collect two months' rent of a deposit, and, and you're set. If they don't pay rent, then you can just use that. Just don't bother with last month's rent. Once the lease is in full session and the tenants are paying their rent on time automatically, uh, then now all you really have to do is deal with repairs as they come up. So when you do get a request for a repair, and it's usually you'll get a bunch right in the beginning when the tenants move in because they're getting used to the property and they don't know quite how it works yet, uh, you always want to acknowledge those requests within hours. Sometimes all it takes is for somebody to say, you know, I hear you. And that will be enough to calm them down and, and let them just kind of subside and be okay with the matter. But if you don't respond, at all, they're just going to get more angry and fired up and they're going to want to break the lease. And it just leads to all kinds of domino effects that are horrible. So always respond to those requests within hours. It doesn't mean that you have to fix anything quite yet. Just acknowledge that you're going to look at it or take care of it or do something. Number two, I encourage all of my tenants to call me anytime. Literally call me anytime because, uh, I want to know if, if something's wrong. I mean, seriously, if if the leaf, if the sorry, if the roof is leaking at three in the morning, I need to know that. I want my tenants to tell me, "Hey, it's raining and the floor is getting wet," or or if the basement's flooding or there's a leaky pipe somewhere. Like, I'd rather know about it at three in the morning than at eight in the morning the next day when there's four more inches of water in my basement. So. Uh, I encourage them to do that. And most people are adults about it. They don't call unless it really is an emergency. Um, you know, if it's just that the garbage disposal isn't working, they'll wait until the next morning to call because it's too much of a hassle for them to deal with it that late. Anyway, I always am available via text message. And most of my tenants now are between, you know, try 22 and 35 and they text more than they call. So if I can be available that way, it not only gives me some sort of, evidence and writing that it's happening, but, um, but they like it too. They, they, they think that's better. So it's a better customer service. Number three, always give proper notice every single time that you go over there. I actually just was talking with another landlord on landlordology and, uh, um, I'm sorry, this was a tenant and she was saying how she she uh, had an argument with her landlord. The landlord just showed up outside and was like kicking around the grass and kind of looking around. And she went over to him and said, what are you doing here? You, you, you just can't show up. And he goes, I can do whatever I want. It's my property. And he is so wrong. <laughs> Please don't think that that will land you in big time trouble. Uh, almost every state has a statute that regulates how much time you have to give before you, you can even show up on the premise. Um, you know, some landlords try to skirt this law by doing drive-bys where they never actually get out of the property. 
But not only is that just frowned upon, it's also very stalkerish and just creepy. So, you know, don't be the creepy landlord. Just uh, if you're if you have to go over there for any reason, just give them notice. I always recommend about 24 hours. Um, your statute might might be much different than that, but that's a general rule of thumb. Um, when a tenant when you give notice, a tenant cannot actually refuse your entry. So it is your house and you can go in anytime you want as long as you give proper notice. If you don't, uh, the landlord could take you to jail and you could or take you to court and, and you'll lose. Uh, number four, use a lockbox for trusted contractors. This is uh, a, a trick I learned a while back. I usually have a hidden lockbox somewhere on the property that I have a combination and I, I only give it to very, very, very trusted contractors, people who I, handyman that I know well and have worked with for years and people that I would trust to babysit my kid. So uh, only use it in cases of emergency or if the tenants have refused their right to be present when the contract is there and they have okayed that the contractor can go in by himself. Um, other than that, uh, do not ever, 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 ever give the combination to your tenants because they will, they will use it and they will give it to their boyfriends or girlfriends or just, you know, lock themselves out and then use it and then not put it back and it won't be there when you need it. Next, the lease has almost finished and it's time to consider whether or not the tenants are actually staying or they're moving out. What I do in my lease is I require that the tenants give 60 days notice of non-renewal on fixed term leases. Typically with fixed term leases, there's no requirement that, that uh, it's going to renew. There's no assumption that it's going to renew. So uh, technically in most states, they don't have to give any notice, but if they do agree to it in, in, the, um, in the lease, then they have to follow that uh, because it's not in conflict with a statute. It's just the statute might be mute on the matter. So what this does is it, it forces them to tell me what their intentions are. They may not know where they're going to move to, but they may know that they don't want to live there anymore. So uh, this just lets me, uh, gives me at least 60 days to find new tenants. If a tenant comes to me 45 days out and says, hey, listen, I knew I was going to renew, but now I'm not going to. They're still responsible for 60 days worth of rent, even if that lease expires. And that's how I phrase it in my in my lease. And so. It makes it's just a good policy and, and they don't they don't tend to um, argue it much. I always try to be a good landlord and around 70 days out, I will send them all an email and I'll say, hey, listen, just FYI, there's this clause in your lease. We talked about it earlier. Just you need to let me know in the next you know 10 days what uh, what your intentions are. And then they're always real cool with it then. Number two, uh, don't always raise the rent. You know, it, it's a huge bargaining chip. And if you can uh, keep a really great tenant, you know, a valuable quality tenant is so much is worth so much more than raising the rent. And so consider using that to try to get a good t tenant to stay. Uh, but and then, and then use the opportunities when the tenant does leave to raise the rent on the next tenants. That, that's how I've kind of ran my business for the last 10 years. And it's worked out real well. Uh, number three, host showings four to six weeks out. I don't know what it is about four to six weeks out, but it seems to be kind of the magical time frame. I guess most people are looking for a new place to live about four to six weeks out, and they're trying to decide if they're going to give their landlord notice at 30 days or, or what. But uh, I usually find and secure my tenants about four to six weeks prior to the end of the lease. Um, number four, when those tenants are finally moving out, you want to give them instructions and a, and a cleaning list on how to successfully move out. They're looking to you for guidance. And so you need to tell them that if you want to move out um, and you want your full deposit back, the place needs to be super clean. It, you know, it just, you know, here's a list of things to do. Clean the oven, clean the floors, clean the windows, um, and then instructions on how to handle keys and all that. Uh, don't be afraid to to be a leader in that aspect. I mean, heck, it's your house. You should have a say in it. That concludes the, the steps. <laughs> you know, once they move out, you go back to listing the property and, and then trying to find new tenants. The next part I want to talk about are, are rental laws. And I'll get into uh, what, what I like to call maybe the top 10 laws that you should be aware of as a landlord. 
So again, they're not specific to a uh, to a, uh, a state or your state, but they are generalized. And so you should look these up and I'll show you where you can look these up. So we don't really have federal laws for landlord tenant um, relationship, but we do have something called the Uniform Residential Landlord Tenant Act of 1972. And this was put together by a group of commissioners and they they really were trying to set the standard for landlord tenant relationships in the United States. And and uh, they did a pretty good job. And in fact, a good portion of our states have adopted this framework as the basis for their uh, their landlord tenant acts, but uh, they've adapted them and altered them. So uh, we don't have a uniform national adoption of it. And in fact, adoption of the act was only optional and, and many states chose not to. So uh, we're getting there. I think they're actually going to modify this act in 2014, maybe even 2015 and try to push the states harder to adopt it. Uh, but until then, you're stuck with state statutes and, and even sometimes county statutes that vary. Number two, return of deposit. Uh, you need to know how many days you have until you return the deposit. I mentioned earlier, but it is so true. And every lawyer, I think, would agree, agree with me that uh, the, the number one um, legal case between landlords and tenants is, is over the deposit. And they, they argue all the time over it, and it's a, it's a big area of conflict. So oftentimes it's because the landlord had no idea what the laws were and they waited too long to give out the deposit and, or they didn't process it correctly. So uh, usually states vary, but usually it's between 15 to 60 days after move out or lease termination. And you also have to give an itemized receipt or itemized list of damages with receipts and have that money uh, from a separate account. And so not all states require the separate account, but most do. And it's just, if you don't follow those rules, then it can be considered that you were with, you know, holding the deposit incorrectly or you didn't follow the rules and therefore the tenant can then sue you. And that gets me into the next step. Number three, if a tenant sues you for wrongful withholding, I'll use the illustration from before about the carpet. If you withhold a thousand dollars and the carpet only costs 600, then the tenant could actually sue you for sometimes up to three times the deposit amount, which would be then $3,000 and they would win. How hard would that be? <laughs> How horrible, I should say. Uh, if you had to pay a total of you know $3,000 plus your 600 for the carpet that the tenant should have paid for in the first place. But uh, just make sure you get the deposits right. It's so critical. Number four, not all states allow non-refundable fees. Some states do. Currently, it's Arizona, Nevada, West Virginia, Florida, Utah, Wyoming, Georgia, and Washington. But uh, when I say non-refundable fees, I mean things like cleaning fees, where your lease might say, you know, there's a $250 non-refundable cleaning fee when you move out. You can't do that. I guess you can in some of these states, but you, you really generally shouldn't do that. I think it's wrong because you're assuming that the tenant's going to leave the place dirty. Even if every tenant before that has left the place dirty, uh, you just can't assume it. So if the tenant leaves it dirty at the end, then just withhold $250 from their security deposit and get it cleaned. But you can't just assume and, and say it's non-refundable. So, uh, just be cautious. I think that's that's walking on thin ice. Number five, rent grace periods. Some states do regulate this and some don't at all. So uh, my state does not have a grace period. Uh, so I can actually start charging rent uh, or charging late fees on the, the day after it's due. But some, some uh, states regulate it up to 15 days or even higher. So make sure you know what that is. Uh, late fees, number six. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I do charge a percentage and then a, a day fee. Uh, what this does is let's say on the second day of the month for me, uh, my late fee can kick in. And so I'll charge anywhere from five to 10%, whatever's in the lease on the second. And then starting on the third, I will charge a $20 daily fee for every day that they haven't paid their rent. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, accrue on each other. I mean, it, it is a $20 late fee, but um, 
but all I really care about is that rent amount. So what this accomplishes is that once a tenant actually misses the deadline and they accrue the late fee on the second and it's that percentage fee, then there's nothing, you know, if I don't have a daily late fee, there's nothing to prevent them from just waiting until the end of the month to pay rent. You know, their attitude is like, well, if I already got a late fee, then I can just, you know, I don't need to pay it tomorrow. I can wait a few more days or even 30 more days as long as I get it in before the next rents due. And if there's a daily late fee, then there's a penalty for them waiting. So there's this urgency that it creates. I don't actually want them to have a late fee. It, it's not really a moneymaker for me, but it does create incentive. Number seven, notice to enter. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. I always recommend 24 hours if there's no state statute, but if there is a state statute, then uh, make sure that you follow that. that. That's so critical. Otherwise, you're just uh, disrupting their their quiet enjoyment. Um, I mentioned the federal seven uh classes of discrimination there's also sometimes marital status sexual orientation source of income or age depending on what state or city you're in so my general rule of thumb is just don't discriminate upon any of those things on that list uh i'll point out the source of income that was that's a great example um of the trust fund baby that i had earlier who was 22 and had two million dollars in the bank so I didn't discriminate upon him because he, though he didn't make any money, he had plenty of it. Number eight, non-payment. Now, what this means is how many days do you have to wait before you can terminate the lease if they don't pay rent and therefore um, start the eviction process if they don't leave. So with non-payment, it's usually anywhere from between zero to 10 days after they um, don't pay rent on the first or whenever the grace period starts, I guess or ends, I should say, uh, they always have an opportunity to remedy the situation or quit. What that means is once you give notice that the lease is going to terminate in 10 days, they have a chance to pay rent. And if they pay rent, then it, it voids your notice. You can also do this with lease violations, but lease violations aren't typically considered as heavy as a, a non-payment. So oftentimes a tenant has 30 days and a great example is if a tenant went and, you know, brought two dogs into their house, even though the lease says no dogs or no pets and you tell them, Hey, you're violating the lease. Uh, you have 30 days to remedy or quit, meaning get rid of the dogs or leave and they could get rid of the dogs and then they can be allowed to stay. There are a few uh, states in number 10, that do allow unconditional quit notices, which means that if you violate the lease or you don't pay rent in, in those states, you can actually just, um, with proper notice, you can terminate it and they don't have an opportunity to remedy it. So uh, they don't have to, even if they do get rid of the dogs, they still aren't allowed to stay. Um, or if they try to pay you rent, you can actually deny it and say, I'm sorry, it's unconditional quit. You know, you're going to leave. So uh, take note of those states. If that's you, that's great because that is a strong um, card that you can play as a landlord. Now I'm going to get into some general best practices that go along with the laws, but they do vary uh, even from town to town. And so uh, whenever I'm trying to get a property ready to rent, I always make sure that I can get each room up to 68 degrees at least. And this is just because I don't want people to freeze. <laughs> Um, and, you know, a cold tenant is a bad tenant and an unhappy tenant. I always make sure that any bedroom or any room that I intend to use as a bedroom has two forms of exit, just so I'm, I'm following the fire code. Uh, and also, if it's truly a bedroom, it should have um, it should have a closet as well. Number three, smoke detectors. This is uh, very important, actually. I mean, most states require that there's a smoke detector in each bedroom and a CO detector, uh, which is carbon monoxide in, uh, in a hallway or somewhere close to a bedroom. And I usually say 15 feet. What this does is it makes sure it ensures that each of those tenants has an opportunity to, to vacate if there's a fire or, or get out and it, it alarms them. Um, but if you don't have that and there's a statute that's saying that you need one in each bedroom, then if someone got injured or, uh, you know, pr property was theoretically damaged. Um, 
and you didn't provide enough alarms where there should be alarms, then you could be held liable. I mean, heaven forbid if, if someone really got hurt or died and they took you to court over, I mean, that's a game changer. That would change your life forever. Not, not just the guilt, but I mean, the type of lawsuit they could bring on you would be devastating for you, your family and your, um, your legacy. So just, just buy some smoke detectors. Heck, you can buy a five pack at Costco for, I think, $30. Number four, everyone should know what their nuisance laws are. Most nuisance laws uh, surround trash, noise, and weeds in the yard. And when I say weeds, I mean like giant weeds and, and four foot tall grass and there's rats in it and all that. Uh, but believe it or not, a landlord is the one that's held responsible if a tenant creates a nuisance in the neighborhood. So if, if the police are called on, on nuisance issues to a, a rental property, uh, the police will look up the owner of the address and actually find the owner uh, multiple times if they need to before uh, the nuisance is taken care of. So make sure that you can violate, or I'm sorry, make sure that you can terminate a lease because of a lease violation due to noise ordinances or, or any type of nuisance. Number five, I always check in at least once a month, and that could be just an email saying, hey, uh, guys, you know, is there anything that needs my attention? Or uh, or, I'll, or I'll do a drive-by. You know, I'll let them know I'm just swinging by and I, I'm going to come in and I'll give them proper notice and I'll say, uh, you know, you don't have to be there. I'm just going to look around and make sure everything seems okay. I never snoop. You don't want to be that landlord. You literally just want to kind of look around, make sure the pipes look okay. Uh, make sure that the yard looks okay. Make sure there's no hazards because um, if somebody gets hurt and you were neglecting a, uh, some sort of deck that was falling apart or a porch or something, then you could be held liable for that too. All right, guys, we're finally to the resources page. Thanks for, thanks for sticking with me on this. I know that was a lot of information. I'm just trying to give you as much value in this presentation as possible. So with resources, um, I'm going to go through these real quick and then show you what that looks like on landlordology. So we have a section called our state rental laws where you can look up all the rental laws for your state. I'm currently trying to consolidate the statutes to into a one page summary. And I've done that for the majority of the states, I think 26 now maybe, but, um, but then there's also links to the external sites. And then there's also a link to the, um, the URLTA of 72. Uh, I'll show you the landlord guides, and these are guides that I've written myself, uh, and I'm, it's an ever-growing library, and I'll get to that in a minute. Next would be the toolbox. <laughs> these are my, my favorite tools that I think are really high quality, and uh, it actually takes a lot to get on this list. I have a lot of vendors who email me quite frequently, and they say, you know, what, what can it take to get on this list? And honestly, it's got to be a product that I think is is quality and actually improves the lives of landlords, not just make busy work for them. And then the landlord life cycle. And this is a great uh, high level summary of the life cycle that I just described to you in this presentation. And last but not least is a new podcast service that I've, I've titled Ask Lucas. And it's literally where you just ask a question in an audio recording and you'll get an answer uh, in the form of a podcast. So let's go check that out. If you go to landlordology.com, up here in the resources section, there's actually uh, all of those links above. And first, I'm going to look at the state laws. On here, you'll see a map of the United States, and you can click on whatever state you want, um, which would then take you to a summary of that state, let's say North Carolina, for example. So all the links to the statutes as well as where they, what statutes are referencing these answers. So it's a really great resource. And... Some of them have a lot of comments. North Carolina has 29, but I think California might be up to almost 700 comments now. Feel free to ask away there and you'll get answers. Uh, the next part is the guides that I mentioned. These are, these are really thorough guides. If you're looking for some of the, um, some more meat and potatoes behind some of the presentation from today, you can check out any of these guides because they're, they're exhaustive and they're really great. Uh, for example, the one on tenant screening, uh, goes into the tools like the e-signature tools and the screening tools that I use and how, how they really are effective. Um, and you can get it for free. Just tell us where to send it and just fill out the form and, and click go and, and you'll get, 
you'll get the guide. Um, next is the toolbox. And like I said, this is, this is just a, a toolbox for landlords. It, on the left here, you have navigation where you can go through in these various categories and you can check out things for collecting rent or where can I find legal forms for my state? And these are all highly recommended. I, I've tried them all and I think that they're worth mentioning. Um, I wouldn't put it on here if it was if it was just really bad. But uh, some other books that I've read and, and things that I've tried to learn, uh, people that I've learned from. This one's real great. Uh, the Fair Housing Helper. This is written by um, by an amazing author who who just really knows his stuff when it comes to fair housing. Uh, and uh, the advertising tools I use to market and just how to use them. So check it out. Everything you'd ever need, I think, would be here. And if I'm missing something, let me know. A landlord life cycle is the last or second to last one. And this is every phase in the landlording process, starting from performing your research and then buying a property all the way to move in, move out and returning the deposit and then eventually growing your portfolio to being millions and millions of dollars. And so not only does it give you each step, but it also shows you which tools you can use to accomplish these goals, which are highlighted in check marks. So as you scroll down, you can see the various stages, you know, pre-lease and lease and post-lease and, and then on to administration and taxes and things like that. So check it out. Uh, it's just something I've tried to map out, which would be really effective. Last is Ask Lucas, and it's a, a bite-sized Q&A show that, that I answer your questions about landlording. It's super easy. There's a player here where you can look at past episodes and listen to them. Uh, either on your phone or here on a, on uh, your computer. And then if you want to ask me a question, just go ahead and click this button that says record a question and you'll get a little pop up that then lets you start recording. Uh, you may have to allow your microphone to be used, but once it is, then it will start recording. And then, uh, you know, eventually you just ask the question and then send it on its way. And I'll be, um, I'll listen to that and I'll try to answer it in the podcast. All right, let's go back to the presentation. So those are the guides and the resources that I recommend. Uh, the last one, last one, which I've mentioned a couple of times now is Cozy. Uh, I, I do work with Cozy directly and, and I, um, I use Cozy on all of my rental properties to, to manage them. Uh, Cozy is not a property management company, but in fact, they make the software for landlords. It's the only software that I would recommend for an independent landlord because it's priced right. It's um, it's extremely affordable and it doesn't uh, feel overkill for independent landlords. I I've used other huge companies before that sometimes it just feels like you're killing a fly with a cannon. Uh, and it's designed for large property managers with four or five, six hundred units and how they handle that. But but Cozy is perfect for independent landlords. So what Cozy can do is it, it uh, mainly collects your rent online. It's awesome because, as I mentioned before, take these three tenants, Sarah, Mark, and Jordan, and they all pay a different portion of rent, and, and they can decide whatever that amount is inside the system, and they can split it up evenly or unevenly. And then once they pay their rent on whatever day they choose, it then gets uh, lumped together and sent to the, the landlord's account automatically once payment is, is made in full. It's really the only way to keep joint and several liability and keep everybody responsible. Um, if you have Sarah uh, with other systems, if you have Sarah paying on her own and she pays 950 and then Mark never pays rent and Jordan never pays rent, uh, Sarah feels like she's in the clear. And technically uh, she has a precedent that she is because she's successfully paid a portion and you're allowing that. So, uh, Partial rent payments are just kind of a mess to get into, and you don't want to you don't want to force that um, or even allow that, I should say. Next is tenant screening. So not only will the application come through uh, online, you'll see that here. This is a, a picture of Sarah's um, Sarah's email or application, and you'll you can see that she can actually link in her uh, LinkedIn account, and you'll see past employers, and and it will actually verify her current employment email address by sending a confirmation there that she has to review uh, and then confirm. 
And you can then from this point, not only see the income for Sarah, but any of her roommates put together with Sarah's income. Uh, and it'll show you the percentage that that group equals in, in um, relation to the to the actual rent payment amount. So you can see if, if they qualify based on your percentages. Uh, but if the application isn't enough and you want to order a credit check, all you have to do is push a button and it will go pull the credit report from Experian with the tenant's help and you'll get the score. You'll get, you know, how many accounts that have ever been late and when those accounts were late uh, and any sort of public records they might have that are mentioned through Experian. Again, the credit check is paid for by the tenant, so it's completely free for the landlord. It costs them about $19. Uh, and it's really just uh, an amazing deal. That again is Cozy, and you can check them out at cozy.co. Now we're in the question and answer time, and thank you guys. I, I've seen some of the comments you guys have left and uh, the questions, so I'm going to get to them. <laughs> the first one's actually from Carol D, who sent me this this question and email before before the presentation actually started because she wanted to make sure she got it in. So uh, she asked, what's an effective way to increase rent for a good tenant uh, that I don't want to lose? I rented the first year slightly under market uh, rate to attract interest. How much dollar or percentage to increase? How should I communicate the news? Hey, Carol, that's a really great question. The, uh, the gist is that you have to decide whether you want the tenant more or the rent increase more uh, yeah you can have them both but you're you're pushing your boundaries there i think as i said earlier a great tenant is worth keeping around uh, and is more valuable than a rent increase however if it's not a great tenant um you said it was a good tenant i don't know if that means it's a moderate tenant or what but uh you can go to them if you do want to increase the rent no matter what just go call them up. I'd, I'd actually make it kind of personal at first and just say, Hey, listen, you've been so great. I'm, I, and I hate to even do this, but I've got expenses to pay and I, I need to raise the rent. And it's just something that I do every, you know, every year. So don't take offense to it. It's nothing personal. It's just, it's just business. Um, but I hope you'll stay. And, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about if you need me to upgrade anything or, or whatever and try to provide incentives other ways. And you do have to give them the option during that rent increase, whether or not they want to renew, they, they may leave. Uh, I think a general, every time I try to raise the rent, it's usually uh, only maybe about three or 4%. I know some apartment complexes start at 10 and they just send you a letter. It's like, here's a 10% increase. And that's, that is kind of industry standard, I think. But if it's a good tenant and you like them, you know, just raise it 3%. And then when you, when you um, go to release the property to someone new, that's the opportunity you have to, to market it at a higher rate. I think you're going to do better there anyway. Hope that helps. The next question is from Renee, and she asks, what is the best bookkeeping tax software, or maybe it's bookkeeping and, and or tax software for small-time landlords? And uh, personally, I think the bookkeeping should be done by your project, or, sorry, property management software. And that's kind of what it's for. It's, it's to collect your rent, it's to screen your tenants, it's to order credit reports, and then it's to track all the data, you know, everything that goes behind it. So make sure that your property management software, whatever you're using to manage it, can do that. Cozy does a really great job at, at tracking the rent and making sure that all your income is there and organized by, um, by um, property so that when you actually have to go to your taxes, you can then just print out all your income. And, and show what you made on each of the properties, which is extremely valuable when you're doing your, your personal taxes. Um, for my taxes, uh, I've been using TurboTax Home and Business for the last seven years or so. And um, since then I've, I've been, uh, I have about three LLCs I've created uh, for various other little reasons. And, and then I have one for my properties, but uh, it's been able to handle everything I've thrown at it. Um, it's really fantastic and it, it'll handle your rental properties just fine. If you manage other people's properties and not just your own, then I would suggest probably talking to a tax attorney and getting their opinion and letting them do it. But if it's just yours and you're managing it and you don't co-own it with anybody and you're just dealing with expenses and rent, then then give it a try. You know, if it if you're not comfortable with it, you can always just 
you know, then take your information over to a tax attorney. But it runs about seventy dollars, and um, I think it's well worth the money. I think I see this other note here. You said Quicken Books uh, is rated pretty well, horrible, and worse. <laughs> I would agree with you. I, I don't I don't like Quicken Books, um, especially for rental properties. It just seems to be Again, it seems to be killing a fly with a cannon, um, and it just doesn't quite get it right. Um, Munro asks, are there any online application websites besides Cozy? Hey, that's a, that's a really great question. There are. There are a ton. Um, the trick is, do they integrate with the rest of what you need to do? Uh, anybody can make up an online application uh, website and system. But if, if you have to have multiple systems to get the job done, then you're really creating extra work for yourself. And you're then forcing the applicants to create multiple accounts at multiple websites, and it gets kind of confusing. And then you don't really seem like, like a landlord who's got it all together. You know, a professional landlord has one system that does it all for them. So uh, the ones that I've come across that look real great, uh, look pretty, but they really only do just applications um, and maybe a little bit more with tenant screening, but they, they may not collect rent and, and get into that or track all that data. Uh, one's called renterresume.co and the other one is called rocketlease.com. Uh, they both have been around for a while and, and, and seem um, like they're, they're good at what they do. They just don't do it all. Uh, the other big boys are Appfolio and Buildium, which are big property management software systems. Uh, they are mostly designed for large property management companies that manage other people's properties. So they they have a ton of features that you'll never you'll never touch as a landlord, and a ton of features that are, will just confuse you. And in fact, uh, whenever you know whenever you sign up for them, they often need to put you through a training class just so you can use their system. So I, I've been a Buildium customer in the past, and I, I really don't have any complaints about it, other than just I didn't use about seventy five percent of the features. So. Uh, oh, I see another question from, from you. You said, uh, you know, can you please state the e-signature sites more clearly? Sure. Uh, it's hellosign.com. Uh, like sign, like a signature, hellosign.com, um, signnow.com, and docusign, D-O-C-U-S-I-G-N.com. I would uh, try them in that order. Try hello sign first and then sign now and then docusign. So hello sign uh, seems to have everything a landlord needs uh, and nothing that doesn't. So give those a try. That's all the questions we have now. Uh, if you think of anything else, feel free to email me. My, my email address is lucas at landlordology.com. And uh, you can also use Ask Lucas, the podcast uh, Q&A show. So feel free to try that out. I'm looking for, for new um, questions. I, I love it. The ones that have come in have been so great. So. Uh, hit me up on Landlordology if you have any other questions, too. Uh, if you're a big fan of Twitter, that's how you can reach me there. And uh, that's it, guys. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And this has been a fantastic um, experience for me. I love talking about it. And I'll talk about landlording all day long. It's it's really just fun. So thanks again. I hope you had a, a great rest of your day. And, and I'll see you next time.